Hello class, just a couple of words on our first two cases, uh, Cisco and Netflix. Both companies were have some similarities and that these two cases are about companies who achieved a great deal and had superior strategic management um, over the years and recently have had some problems or issues that are forcing the management to look at and evaluate their strategic initiatives um, and rethink how they're going to solve these problems. So both these cases are kind of similar uh, in that nature. Also both these case cases uh, involve companies who are heavily influenced uh, through the business of the internet. So the first case, Cisco, um, we looked at a company here that once was in the 90s and in, you know, Cisco was the company to own as far as stock. It routinely doubled and split its stock price multiple times. It had a vast array of um, products and sales increases and profits. So it's the strategy that they had um, was working. And basically their strategy was for at one point was use the massive leverage of its ever escalatingly strong stock price to buy um, competitors and other companies. So what made the, the firm very successful in its first two decades is that, you know, they basically bought their growth and, and purchased their R&D from other companies. Um, you know, so when a new product that was going to come out that was going to compete or a new product that was something that looked like a high profitable area that was related to Cisco, they moved in and purchased them quickly. Um, so the company got very big, very fast, as you as you read about and looked at. Now, uh, as things started to change and their their stock price really lost its momentum after the tech crash of 2000 and the uh, sort of a lost decade after that, Cisco wasn't really able to buy its way out of its uh, inno lack of innovation or R&D strategies. And then it had some, of course, it had some stumbling blocks in its growth where um, purchasing uh, and trying to move into consumer products such as the flip cam was a huge strategic blunder. Now the flip cam was another company had developed this and it, this is a blue ocean product by the way and the flip cam was revolutionary when it first came out because of you know the ability to easily take a uh, video and put import it into the PC. Uh, what had happened was which they sort of for, for, they should have seen uh, which the original company seen, which they're happy to sell to Cisco, is that uh, the new smartphones were going to take over in this capacity to easily shoot uh, video and upload it into the internet with a la with a very user friendly interface. So, you know, the company had definitely had some sac setbacks in recent years. Now, this their inability to really uh, innovate and develop. Um, their own successful research development and innovation to deploy into its products uh, was really the problem Cisco had in its growth, as well as very aggressive and, and very um, quickly adapting competitors uh, nipping at their heels. You know, the, you know, I think the big problem for investors with Cisco is that they... Um, Cisco's profit margins started to be eroded by the um, not being able to sell a lot of their products at very high prices. As the competitors jumped in with similar products or products that performed just as well at much lower prices, Cisco had to scale back their their what they were charging, and that really hurt their superior profit margins. You know, and also this this ties into um, the life cycle where, you know, as Cisco's products matured and more competitors were able to catch up, uh, you know, they weren't adapting fast enough to uh, really keep their products at the cutting edge or develop new products that would be in the earlier uh, side of the, the, uh, the life cycle. Now, this is, you may have actually see something similar to what happened at, at Cisco. If you look at Apple, Something similar may happen to Apple, where um, their iPhone was so revolutionary and had so many innovative features in the beginning, but now as other f smartphones are catching up to them, is there enough disparity between 
the Apple iPhone and the competitors to really um, command such a high price for that for the Apple product. So there there are some similarities between what's happened at Cisco to what could be happening at Apple now moving forward. So this is a very interesting case for the class to, to research and look at because strategic management uh, of a company that was very successful and then not successful and leaving an opening here for you to, to sort of um, reflect upon that and provide me with some information about why they weren't successful First, you get a chance, I guess, to review and learn how they were initially very successful and then learn about the mistakes they had made in, in the last several years that left their strategic um, initiatives lacking and then give me some uh, insight and some ideas of how they can change this and move it forward. Now, when this is a good example of a case where you can do additional research easily on the Internet through looking at... Um, other articles, and, and this case was put together, I think I, I put it together about a year and a half ago. Uh, certain developments have really moved forward that you could easily have researched, picked up on, and, and gave me some direct quotes uh, in the paper. The cloud computing is, an, is sort of the next big area that Cisco has to maintain a leadership in if they want to make, uh, grow or innovate their company. So, they, so I did include some information on that. Now, if you go to Cisco's website, which I have here, there's a lot of also additional information here, such as you know all the products that uh, they they offer, um, you know different um, training and events. Also, uh, Cisco's annual report would have been a good source of information about the company, their strategic changes, what the management is saying about um, their company moving forward. You know, as well as any type of down here when they have the news and alerts, there's a lot of additional information here. Um, and there should be a link for investors where you can get uh, investor relations, annual reports, and different inf information. So a lot of these cases, going to the company's direct website is a good source of additional information support uh, for the company, uh, I mean for the paper. Um, you know, so when I ask questions about you know what type of products they have or how do they how do they manufacture their products, you know a lot of that can be found out not only in the articles that I provide but doing just some basic research on the internet. And a lot of what I'm expecting with these papers is that you give me a graduate level um, paper in response, which means you don't just regurgitate the basic articles I attach to this case to help you get started. You really combined three elements. One element, of course, would be the foundation of the articles I provided. Another element would be your business acumen, the business information that you know from working in the business world and taking other college courses. That's why they generally look for this class to be the capstone class or class you take um, in the later half of your MBA career, not the beginning part of your MBA career. So you have more of that the uh, information from the other courses to help you with these types of cases. And the third part is your independent research, thinking about and looking for additional uh, supplemental uh, information and support for your answers. Um, so I look you to blend the three together to produce a really highly high level, um, well-researched, well-written paper that shows me that you are a professional academic graduate student who can uh, produce something uh, professionally. And also the citations you leave me uh, must be in a, an appropriate citation uh, format. I've left um, announcements and emails about citations in different formats you can use. You can't just simply copy a web link and slap it at the bottom of the paper and think that's your citation. I mean, all citations need an author and an article. Um, if it's a citation where there are uh, no authors or articles, like if you're trying to cite uh, the main website, you can, you can include, I guess, just a link to the main website and then maybe a description of where you pull that data from the website, such as, you know, you could cite the website and then say, you know, under news and alerts in the newsletter, you know, just give me a little bit of a breakdown. But uh, I've, it's something that all professional writing should have when any type of um, information is cited. So, um, so Cisco is a pretty uh, interesting case, and I think a lot of people don't know as much about Cisco because it's not something that's in your consumer-oriented world. This is more of a business-to-business -business product. Now, the second case um, that I had assigned was Netflix. Now, 
Netflix is something that we're all familiar with. You may or may not have had Netflix service in the past. Um, and what we're looking at here is a company who had very successful, again, just like Cisco, had very successful strategy in the beginning and then sort of lost their way um, as their business got a lot bigger and as they started to change their thinking or strategic um, ideas, uh, has really... Um, made some big mistakes basically and I think one of the problems that you should pick up on here with Netflix is that um, Reed Hastings is really the guy in charge so his strategic management um, he's, seems like he's doing a lot of it by himself which could be a problem because strategic management is best done in a team effort and not by an individual I think that um, sometimes the individual um, may have a, an idea that's really not that good and he needs other people there to tell him or you know or discuss this and, and kind of uh, work this out with them before they deploy some of these ideas that could have horrible consequences now you know of course Netflix in order to be to maintain the growth that the investors really um, expect they had to keep growing the sales uh, and hopefully developing more and more profits. Now you can see here on this on this web on this um, stock chart of Netflix, they're at hundred dollars right now. But at one point they were very close to being a three hundred dollar stock. And you can see up here back in January, um, sorry, the first part of first half of two thousand eleven, the stock reached about almost almost three hundred dollars a share. Then this policy came out where they changed their chart, what, how they charge people for their subscriptions, and you could see how devastating that was to the stock price. Um, temporary recovery and another downward trend. Right now it seems like they're kind of crawling their way back. And if you did any additional research on this, or on this company, Netflix, you'll see that in the last uh, six to eight months, they've made some strategic changes that have helped uh, res, you know, resurrect the stock price somewhat. One of the big things I, I was definitely hoping people include in the paper is uh, Netflix's Netflix um, incorporation of new original content. They're coming out with um, two, uh, two big new series. Uh, one of them starring Kevin Spacey, and the second one is a a, a, um, a resurrected Arrested Depre Development. Uh, sitcom that they're going to offer exclusively from Netflix. So Netflix is changing their strategy to say, okay, we have to be more than just reruns and rentals of movies. We have to have original content. So if we're going to compete, we need to have this original content. So that's some new stuff, new strategic uh, organization that they're doing now. Now what, you know, basically uh, Netflix has two major business areas. It has their streaming and their mail order DVD business. And Netflix um, spent a lot of time and money developing the United States and turning them into, uh, you know, a powerful market for them. Looking to expand into foreign markets, uh, the dangerous thing here is foreign markets. Uh, it's expensive to, to uh, transition to foreign markets. In a business like Netflix, which has an infrastructure of maintaining a huge database of DVDs or or um, streaming content and the um, networking and storage uh, problems with that as well as the physical uh, mail order issues it's expensive and then strategically difficult to expand the company internationally especially if, you know um, if, and there's high expectations that they're going to get it right on the first attempt which investors may not may become impatient if profits don't materialize quickly and it's really Netflix is looking to be a more of a longer term business and they're struggling to deal with um, changes in technology and we talk about this uh, in both books uh, in some of my lectures that you know as technology changes so quickly um, especially in the area of media and content Netflix has to be constantly updating their um, the technology the delivery of their services beginning just sort of a low-tech idea of just mail order DVDs worked well but in the case where streaming is becoming more prevalent of TV shows they had to switch to more of a streaming oriented content now as content providers that offered streaming um, abilities 
became more crowded, the prices for streaming this content became more expensive. So it was a constant battle of how much are we charging for this? Um, what are we paying to allow these, these, these shows to be, this content to be streamed? And how can we balance it so there's a profit in the middle? It's a very difficult strategic um, uh, plan to make sure that this uh, that they can provide the content at a profitable level. Now you can see that there is a big uh, a blowback when they try to raise prices in effect. Uh, now having competitors like Coinstar which has their uh, Redbox which is a very low cost um, way to rent DVDs you know that is something that Netflix I don't think they anticipated or expected to be um, hit so severely from from a more physical market, more retail market, and, and that sort of surprised them. Now, now internationally is, is, is definitely a way for them to grow their company and, and help get the, maximize the return, the shareholders' wealth. So that's why strategically that was important for them. But international DVD rentals, um, there's a lot of, there's, it's a tricky business to navigate. Especially if you know a U.S. U.S. based company that has a little experience overseas, this this is where I think Netflix could have had a better strategic um, deployment and maybe have hired more professionals with the experience of expanding internationally. And we talked about the different um, modalities of expanding internationally. Um, you know, I mean. We didn't specifically talk about it, but part of your business acumen that you should know from your other courses is that if you want to expand in an international way, there are a couple of different ways of doing that. Uh, one student in class found this uh, website, the Quick MBA, and this is a good website if, if you're not familiar with, if you don't have all the information from going through uh, the majority of an MBA program, this is a good site to look uh, a couple of key terminologies up, or if you have certain classes you haven't taken yet, this is a good site to fill in the blanks and some of the questions I might be asking or some of the um, some of the business terms I talk about in the textbooks. And here are the foreign market entry modes. You, um, you have exporting, licensing, joint ventures, and direct investment. Now, exporting, of course, is just um, having someone exporting your product to somebody else who imports it and sells it for you as a, as a middleman. Uh, licensing is basically um, selling the idea or the license uh, you know the company permitting permitting a base, I guess um, a company in a foreign country to uh, sell your property or sell your uh, products. Uh, you know you could using I guess trademarks, patents, uh, things of this this nature. You can charge a fee for another company, and then they have the right to uh, work with your uh, intangible property and. Um, in another country. A joint venture is teaming up with another company to, um, to work together so you get a foreign competitor that, no, not, not competitor, a foreign company that um, has a good overall understanding of the foreign market and good dis distribution in the foreign market and you form a joint venture to bring your product over and but of course you have to share the profits with them um, you know thus, and we also have uh, direct investment the other thing about the, the joint venture is that working with a domestic com company in a foreign country helps you over, uh, overcome some import-export issues or re regulations, helps you to um, uh, avoid cultural clashes, and just using their expertise in their market to bring your product is a real shortcut. But it comes at a cost. You have to really give up some of your profits. Um, Direct foreign investment is basically going into the other company and having direct ownership uh, of corporations or businesses or acquiring corporations or businesses in um, another country. So sort of just taking over their operations uh, and therefore you have a foothold that's established and well-recognized in the foreign country and then you could work through that subsidiary to bring your products through the foreign country. So this is just you know a quick over, 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 overview if you did, weren't sure what uh, market entry modes were. And this is the type of research I'm talking about sometimes when you come across something you don't fully understand or a question I'm asking you, but you're not sure what the business terminology is, you need to sometimes do a little research to pick up on, you know, uh, and catch up on, you know, this, um, this material. Okay, so, you know, so going back to the Netflix case. Now, 
and you could see that you know um, Reed Hastings did try to apologize to their consumer their customers and they tried to make it right but didn't quite work um, now along the way um, the competition between Hulu and Amazon as streaming content providers has intensified a great deal where um, as you can see in the Hulu and I, I have subscribed to Hulu and Netflix in the past they have a good uh, base of content and a, and a real advantage for Hulu is you get current content a lot quicker where Netflix has to wait for products to be released or on DVD or for streaming have to be released in a certain period of time has to pass before they allow the content to be streamed so you don't get very new content through Netflix you get older content that has to be either a movie that has been released to DVD or a TV show that has passed a certain amount of time um, so they'll so they'll allow Netflix to stream it because they don't want Netflix to compete with DVD sales or uh, current uh, advertising on the networks where Hulu which was started by a group of networks um, I'm not exactly sure which uh, media companies but they got together and said let's create a streaming um, arena for our content before people start stealing it and pirating it and streaming it illegally so let's give the people the content they want but in this way the one downside to Hulu is that you can't really eliminate the commercial content so when you watch anything on Hulu you have to watch the commercial segments as well which is sort of disappointing especially when you pay for the service and you have to watch the uh, commercials as well but I mean you do the same thing with cable um, so in order for Netflix to compete against Hulu, which has a lot of original content, it's developing as well. You know, who, um, Netflix is trying to develop their own original content or make their own uh, content deals for um, materials that you can only get through Netflix. Uh, now, there is a high barrier to entry to these markets now, both to get into the content streaming market or to get into foreign markets that this is one of the problems Netflix definitely came across is the money it takes and put them in a you know, significantly debt position to, to expand. Um, but, you know, if Netflix can get the first mover advantage going into these companies, these countries to really be the first provider of the streaming content or provider of the of um, different um, delivery systems for movies, they can have an extreme advantage. You know, so again, this is a case about a company that had superior strategic management for a while, faltered, um, it's, and had to rethink how it's going to strategically deploy itself. It's also uh, similar in Cisco, where this, uh, both companies, their, their, their shining success early on encouraged competitors to enter into the marketplace, compete against them directly, and in some cases, out-innovate uh, Netflix and Cisco in a way that put them in a really um, dangerous position and it's hard for a company to go in the beginning of their life cycle to have such success and be so uh, so grow so quickly and generate in some cases a huge amount of profits and then um, have that uh, the pinnacle of success erode away from them so quickly as other companies see what they're doing catch on uh, try to deploy similar um, strategic models and chip away at, at their strong uh, business model and you know I think this is a similar thing we're gonna see with Apple in the coming years is that other competitors are gonna get much closer to Apple and which is you know threatening uh, Apple's large profit margins and I already heard that Apple is thinking about making a low-end cheaper iPhone to help um, you know, to help even the playing field a little bit against some of the other cell phone companies, which routinely do this as well. But if that's going, it's going to be a tricky play for them because if they release a lower cost iPhone that has that is almost as good as the higher cost iPhone, then you may be de deteriorating your bread and butter. So we'll see what happens there. But again, both these these cases are a good way to start the class and get you to see how dynamic the strategic management of a company is and how quickly it has to change and adapt to an ever-changing and competitive world. Ideally, um, 
I don't feel bad for these companies because it's this competitive environment and this uh, extremely innovative environment that the consumers benefit from. So because of this competition, us as consumers, we have been getting better technology, better bandwidth, better uh, products from network companies like Cisco. Um, and the competition has directly fostered that. In the case of Netflix, we've been getting more entertainment um, content availability through many different sources and helps to reduce the level of price we pay and also incre increase the amount of content. And one of these things coming up, which only a few students mentioned, uh, which I was hoping for more students to pick up on this, is the um, network specific streaming devices like HBO Go where I have HBO Go it comes free with your HBO subscription and you can watch everything they have to offer all their past TV series every episode all their current movies that they have under contract I mean it really is an amazing product I mean I feel one of the reasons I don't have Netflix right now is that HBO Go has so much content on it for free I really don't see the need of a subscription for Netflix um, and, H and HBO was smart where they don't allow anybody to stream the content but HBO. So, you know, these are things that are happening in the current environment of content and media delivery that I was looking for students to pick up on and talk about. And, you know, in many cases, I, I like you to kind of think about what you would do and how you could improve the situation if you were actually working for the company. So... Okay, so this was just a, a quick overview of the first two cases and just a, a talk of why they're important, how they're, you know, how we learn as business students is not just, you know, reading textbooks and, and answering quizzes, but it's also about thinking and applying what we learn to real world situations. And that's what I want you to do with these cases is I want you to apply what you've learned in school, what you've learned at work, uh, and just your, you know, your your business understanding, I want you to stretch it and flex those muscles and really think about uh, these company situations. And, you know, there's nothing like real world problems to focus on to really sharpen your skills as a business person. And that's, I'm really looking for you to show me um, what you have as what you can contribute to the business world. You know, you know, if I was um, running a company and I was going to hire somebody, I certainly would want to know uh, how do they think about things and what's their strategic thinking and how could they, what perspective could they provide me that about a company that I haven't thought of. And that's why I love reading your papers because you really, a lot of times I do learn something and you, and you bring up aspects of things that I haven't thought about. And it's, you know, it's really quite interesting when a, per, when a student puts uh, um, a significant amount of effort into her paper and really thinks and really applies um, the tools that they learned uh, in business school and in the real world to you know a current case and in many case, many times these cases you're familiar with the company and the product that's why the cases I pick I try to pick the the companies you'd be familiar with and you have a good uh, understanding of so you could really springboard off of it and provide me some excellent material um, okay so um, that is it for now. Keep up the good work. I am, I am very impressed by most students uh, posting on the discussion boards. I know this is a very short class and there's a lot of work to be done, but um, everybody so far is doing a pretty good job and just uh, keep up. And to keep this in perspective too, that if this was a course that you were going to Stony Brook to take in person, uh, the class would be four hours a day, four days a week. So that would be 16 hours of class, plus for most students an hour involvement getting to campus into the classroom and getting home so you're talking about you know you know about 20 to 24 hours worth of uh, direct involvement before you do any homework if this was a winter class so keep that perspective when you start to think this class is too much work remember that you know these winter classes um, students do spend an average of 30 to 40 hours a week working on the material in, in these winter classes uh, to complete them because we are crunching 14 weeks worth of coursework into three and um, of course I've I've tried to design this class in a way that it's achievable and I learned a great deal from last year and I eliminated um, some work to make sure it was more size appropriate okay so I look forward to your next case studies coming up and I would just like to keep every to tell everybody to keep up the good work and I'll be talking to you soon Take care.